I'm Bella Perez Rubio, Puma Podcast, and you're listening to Teka Teka News. Balitang thinking, hindi breaking. In this episode... Today, we present you a community engagement plan. And this aims to be a blueprint, a starting point, a humble starting point for building new spaces for deliberation, learning, and political accountability. It's a recognition that living in parallel public spheres where people belong to separate information ecosystems is not sustainable for democratic problem solving. Disinformation researchers led by Jonathan Ong presented their study on influence operations at the Harvard Kennedy School. In it, they proposed several ways to counteract disinformation in the country. First, changing the narrative around disinformation. We argue that many digital literacy initiatives are guilty of perpetuating what we say are anti-massa or anti-poor sentiments when they should be empowering citizens. There's a tendency for some disinformation interventions to reinforce social class divisions. Jonathan adds that this approach of highlighting class divides does more harm than good on several fronts. Usually it's in the discourse of blaming the uneducated or those with cheap phones on free basics as the disinformers. We need to change this narrative. It directly plays into populist assumptions about elitist liberals and gives our enemies more ammunition for the information war. This is also, we say, inaccurate, as we have argued that top trolls are actually elite entrepreneurs protected by politicians who also owe these people a debt of gratitude. Jonathan and his colleagues think we should be doing this instead. We are suggesting that we pivot to new storytelling projects, investigative journalism, and pre-bunking videos that punch up rather than down. Those that would focus on political masterminds running the show or discussing social narratives rather than naming or shaming or in a kind of gotcha journalism approach. Another thing that the disinformation researchers suggest in their study is to loop in the education sector. Second, of course, we're educators and we recognize the importance of making our materials more accessible and speak the language of communities that we really want to target and connect with. So we want to emphasize that we want to create, co-create an open access educational materials and make them available to communities. We seek co-collaborators to co-create an open access course that might curate all of these materials. And finally, Jonathan and his colleagues urge support for whistleblowers and exposing disinformation for hire. The Philippines, along with many Global South countries, we need to engage in uncomfortable discussions about worker ethics and justice in order to address our homegrown disinformation for higher industries. We need to introduce more pain points and accountability mechanisms that shed light on how local firms and local businesses profit from hateful campaigns and yet continue to operate as open industry secrets. Accountability mechanisms are also things Jonathan talks about at length in his show with Puma podcast titled Catch Me If You Can. Catch Me If You Can is one such experiment at normalizing discussions of ethics in the advertising and public relations industries. In each episode, we interview online operators and have them tell their stories about how they were recruited, how much they're getting paid. And the main theme here is also about morality. How do these people sleep at night, right? Like how do they justify these practices and jobs to themselves? We'll pause here, but when we return, former Vice President Lenny Robredo reacts to the study. The study just presented to us confirms and reinforces what we observed 
and experienced firsthand during the 2022 campaign that digital disinformation operations in the Philippines have achieved unprecedented levels of volume, of spread, of sophistication. Former Vice President Lenny Robredo is currently a Center for Public Leadership Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. This is not just simply disinformation, but it's creating a multiverse, another universe where facts and truth differ from the other. We have been at the receiving end of this well-organized, heavily funded campaigns of online disinformation and harassment since 2016. She's been the target of disinformation for several years now. And lately, even the status of her fellowship has been brought into question. Just a while ago, I received an information that the latest news, disinformation about me was that I was kicked out after the first module. (laughs) Um, I'm sorry to say that I just had my second module yesterday and my last uh, next week. Uh, So not, not at all true. The reason why I'm speaking before you is it is not true at all that I have been kicked out of the Harvard Kennedy School. It's probably no surprise then that this information is what the former presidential candidate chose to study after a grueling campaign and election season. I am handling a course here at the Kennedy School on how institutional disinformation has given rise to populism. And the question often asked by students is why the public was so ready to believe the lies. That's that's the most common question. We are reminded that for generations, there existed an undercurrent of frustration against a system that has often served only the well-off, the well-educated, and the well-connected few. And the inability of our democratic systems over the years to diffuse power and impact the lives of our people in a manner that is significantly felt has created a political landscape that was ripe for capture by disinformationists in pursuit of their own agenda. It was the reason why we were so vulnerable. Here are Robredo's other key takeaways from the study. The study makes clear that traditional fact-checking, while important, is no longer enough given the extent to which influencer operations have evolved. But we commend all the different organizations in the Philippines who are into fact-checking because what they're doing is very important, but we should do more. She noted the terminology used throughout Ong's study and why it captures the current media landscape better than terms such as disinformation and fake news. I appreciate the term influence operations instead of disinformation operations as it captures the broader ecosystem of shaping minds and hearts of people. The common baseline of fact um, so essential for dialogue, cooperation, and accountability in a democracy is deliberately being targeted and destroyed. What's more, she agreed that more work needs to be done to expose the powerful actors behind malevolent influence campaigns. The proposed shift in emphasis from battling ground-level trolls, which I think everyone is doing, to exposing the key architects of disinformation, many of whom are able to operate from within the security and respectability of the mainstream communications and creative industries is one I find particularly compelling as it promotes a culture of transparency and accountability. And finally, Lenny Robredo emphasized that government must do its part as well. This is also a reminder to leaders of democracies all over the world, regardless of how young or advanced the democracy is, to always be mindful that it is only when the majority of the citizenry are properly listened to, taken care of, and empowered, can they be less vulnerable to manipulative influence operations of those that seek to disinform and deceive to achieve their own agenda. And that was today's episode of Teca Teca. I'm Bella Perez Rubio. This episode was produced by Kat Ventura and edited by Presh Capistrano. 
And again, do check out our podcast, Catch Me If You Can, hosted by Jonathan Ong and Kat Ventura. If you like this episode, share it with a friend or two. And don't forget to give Teka Teka and Puma Podcast a 5-star rating on your podcast app. It really helps get the word out about our show. At para sa mga mahilig manood sa YouTube, Puma Podcast na rin po kami doon. Just search Puma Podcast and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for listening.